just about now, okay? All righty, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to Wake the Nation. This evening's topic for Wake the Nation is homelessness, being displaced, and hope, because there's always hope. Uh, tonight's panel are my co-hosts, Mrs. Crystal Collier. Uh, she'll be talking about blessing bags and uh, Mrs. Thais Love, who will be speaking about the Way Home exhibit at which she uh, volunteered for, I think, four days. And uh, production behind the scenes is Miss Kamali Vernon. And we have our guests, uh, Mrs. Danette Green. So welcome, 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 everyone. Hello. Say hi to everybody, hi to the people. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So, uh, you know, this title came about because as a result of uh, Mrs. D or Deacon Love um, volunteering at the Way Home exhibit, and I did go down. And I, re I that was the first time I learned that 60% of folks that are in the uh, shelters are families, and a third are children. I, I wasn't aware that there were so many children in shelters. And, uh, you know, the thing about it is that many times we tend to stigmatize those who are homeless. And, you know, folks tend to think that most people who are homeless or on the streets are simply because they've misabused alcohol or drugs. And that's not necessarily the case. We need to be empathetic because they're but for the grace of God, okay? The thing is homelessness is caused by fires, caused by illnesses, caused by rent increase, caused by eviction, caused by loss of uh, income, whether it's a job or a career or a business, uh, domestic violence. And so there are many factors that leads to homelessness. I remembered when there was a fire at my house, I had two children at the time and I was pregnant. And uh, the fire men, when they came after everything was said and done and they had destroyed the door, and the whole house smelled like fire. Every piece of clothing smelled like fire. And they said they, that I should go to a, a, a hotel. They would have taken me to a hotel. But um, uh, thank God my mother was alive. And I was like, mommy. <laughs> I was like, you know, my mama said, come on home, baby. So I came home with the baby who was like, he was, uh, two. He was a toddler. But my first son was in school when the fire um, broke out. So he was like displaced. And, you know, we never think about the children and how they feel, how displaced they are. So that is something that we would like to bring to the, the attention of those who, you know, and for those who are out there, there is a moratorium that might be lifted. They're trying to extend the help that folks are getting. However, we know, we see a lot of, I don't know about anyone else, but me driving around this city here in New York, I see a lot more homeless people than even in 2020. So um, it, there's an uptick uh, and we need to address the issues. There are also folks that are dealing with mental illnesses. Um, you know, folks are just, a lot has gone on and a lot is on a lot of folks' minds. So with that being said, I would like to play a small video and then thank you, production, uh, the video, please. Thank you. Unfortunately, in New York, we have a really hard stigma about homelessness, and I want people to understand that it is solvable and that we are part of the solution. We know at best, when New Yorkers experience homelessness, it feels like a series of hurdles and challenges that are unending. At worst, it feels like a literal maze. 
So we want to exemplify that and have New Yorkers walk through what is the experience of a family that is experiencing housing instability and then maybe loses their home and has to go through the process of searching for permanent affordable housing. We need to show people uh, what the experience really looks like. It's really hard to describe policy in a way that resonates sometimes or feels understandable, relatable. You're not going to leave feeling hopeless and not, you know, know what to do. Like, we have a solution. We have a call to action. We, we want you to ask the next mayor to implement these policy solutions because they're proven and they, and they have worked and they have ended homelessness in other cities across this country. I actually went through uh, the homeless system uh, back in 2006, myself and my five sons. Going through this maze, it just brought back so many memories of what I went through when I went through the shelter system, being shouted at uh, directors, go here, next window, uh, go see this person. No, you're not eligible for this. You're not eligible for that. You need to go over here. There's a part that shows the amount of paperwork, the amount of things that you have to prove to tell someone that you're actually having housing instability or homelessness issues. I think most of us going through it are saying, what does all this cost to keep families in temporary shelter for over 500 days on average? Well, the reality is it costs at least three times more than simply helping someone pay their rent. One of the most important moments that you'll experience when you're walking through the way home is when you get to the center rotunda and you're prompted the question, what does home mean to you? I think the mirror with home, I think that's like the coolest part of the whole exhibit to be, like that you can really reflect on yourself and see yourself in your home and see yourself in that place and it kind of has like a guiding force there. The word that I uh, tapped in was uh, safety. Just having somewhere secure where I can take my children, close my door, and just be, you know, happy in my little world. I've never thought about home housing insecurity, but to sort of see myself reflected in this issue was very moving. One of my favorite parts of the exhibit is at the very end. We have a place where we talk about why ending homelessness is important, how it's not just a moral imperative or something that we should do because it sounds good or important, but it's something that has genuine benefits kind of across society. New Yorkers experiencing this, I think, can go away feeling both outraged and hopeful that we can spend our money and our resources in much more powerful ways. Homelessness is solvable. Homelessness is solvable. Homelessness is solvable. Homelessness is solvable. Thank you. Okay. Yes, homelessness is solvable. It did not begin with us, you know, in our generation or this generation. Homelessness is in the Bible. And many, there have been many homeless folks in the Bible eons ago. Uh, one such man uh, was the gentleman who was by the sheep gate. He was there for 38 years. And he was there so long that he gave up hope that even when Christ came to him and asked him, would you like to be healed? He was like, I have nobody to help me. And sometimes when folks are homeless, sometimes when folks have been in the street, sometimes when folks have been in the shelter, one year, two years, or however long it takes, they start to give up hope. But all hope is not lost. Just like that gentleman that lay there you think about it, someone had to feed him. He was left up to the whim and whimsy of folks that whether or not they felt like giving him something good to eat or not, he was there for 38 years until Christ healed him. And so today, no matter what you're going through, your case is not hopeless, not at all. There is hope. Matter of fact, we're here to encourage you never to give up hope. With that, I would like to introduce to you Mrs. Danette Green, and if she can unmute herself and tell us a little bit about, you know, how you felt when you learned, when you realized you had to um, seek refuge in a shelter. 
Okay. Hello, my name is Danette. And I became homeless after my divorce. Um, I left with nothing. I ended up homeless in a homeless shelter with no help, no support. It was scary. It was a very dark time in my life. Being homeless made me feel ashamed. I was definitely in shock. I felt worthless and hopeless. I felt unimportant. I felt feelings of failure and unworthiness. And as strange as it may seem, I worked for the Department of Defense and I was still homeless. Hmm. I worked every day. I had a good income, but I was still homeless. Despite having a good income and not having any other income, I found myself homeless. And it was like, I couldn't understand. I'm working and I'm homeless. I'm making money. I'm doing everything that I can and I'm homeless. Okay. So I ended up in a homeless shelter with my, myself and my two children. Um, you know, I had a lot of questions like, how could this happen to me? You know, I'm not supposed to be homeless. I don't even know anybody who's homeless, you know. So it threw me for a loop. Um but for sure, if there's anything that'll get a person to praying, it's those hard situations in your life. Even if you're in a black, a backslidden state, um, no matter what your position in life is, some people who hardly pray or never pray, when you're going through those difficult times in your life, that's when you call on the Lord. So yeah, I think I prayed those that was one of the times I've prayed the most that I've ever prayed in my life because I felt like my children deserved better never mind me but my babies they didn't deserve to be homeless and they deserve so much more question so um how long did it take before you got an apartment or or someplace your home, home? well the shelter gives you a limit of how long you can stay whether you have a place or not oh Yes, but I was going to work every day. I even began a second job. I couldn't afford housing. And at that time they weren't giving us housing. So I had to pay someone at the shelter to watch my kids, sorry, my puppy in the background, to watch my kids so that I could work. Um, ironically, I never, I never gave up hope. I never told myself, you're stuck. This is where you're going to end up. This is where you're going to be. Mm. Because I've always had God in my life to some degree. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that although I was in that position, I wasn't going to stay there. But it does feel like while you're in it, that, you know, you hear those voices talking to you saying, girl, you crazy. This is where you are. This is where you're going to be. You are homeless. Ironically, none of my family knew I was homeless. I didn't wow. tell a family member because I was ashamed and I was ashamed mm -hmm. of what they would say about me. I was ashamed of what they would think of me and even more afraid that maybe someone would come after my kids and take my children from me because mm -hmm. of my status. I knew that somehow that it wasn't the end for me. And now I've learned that all things work together for his good. And I've also learned that, you know, nothing in our lives are wasted, that God uses every aspect of our lives to his glory. I didn't know that then. But I've since <laughs> learned that, <laughs> wish I knew it then, but I know it now. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. And, and so how did you transition to getting your, uh, your own home so that you and your kids, you, well, you, I continue you eventually owned your own home, didn't you? Yes. Well, that's basically my story is you can go from being homeless as a single woman with children to owning your own home. Wow. It, it, it wasn't easy. It didn't happen overnight. It took some work and some go-getterism, if that's a word. <laughs> that's a new one. <laughs> but 
it's anything is possible. Anything is possible with God. And the God I serve is a big God. He's an yes. above and beyond God. He'll do exceedingly above and beyond anything that we can ever think of or imagine. And so I knew I would get out of that situation, but I didn't know that I one day end up owning a home. I mean, that was just like unbelievable. That girl that was homeless, me, you mean I'm about to sign and have my own home? But while I was in the shelter, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. And I asked God, sorry, I'm a little nervous. That's okay. I prayed, I asked God that if he would help me, if he would get me out of this situation, if he would save me, that any single mothers that I met that were having problems, especially homeless, that I was gonna help them. Not, not families with a man though, just single women, households, God save me, help me, and I'm gonna do this. I mean, when you make those promises to God, you don't. some of them you don't think you're really gonna have to live out, you know? <laughs> I mean, what are the chances you're gonna run into other single mothers that are homeless? But I did, I met one woman, she was in the park and she was crying and I was just days away from getting my apartment and I was happy and I was on cloud nine and I saw her crying and I said, I asked her what was wrong. And she told me, she pointed to her kids and she said her and her one, two, three children were homeless. And I felt so bad for her because I knew what that felt like. I knew the fear, you know, that that, brings on you, you know, feeling lost, nowhere to go, unwanted. So I told her, I said, you know, I'm not due to get into my apartment for a couple of days. I said, but take my number, call me every day. And when I get in my apartment, you and your children have a place to stay. She called, long story short, I moved them in with me, free, of rent so, so they could get out sooner, save their money. And lo and behold, that's what she did. She was ever, ever, ever so grateful. It worked out well. But that wasn't the only person I helped. I helped another uh, mother and son. I ended up helping God will, you know, you make you live out or see if you're <laughs> up to or you're woman enough to live up to your word, your promise to him. And, you know, now that I look back, I wonder, had I not have kept my word, would I have become a homeowner? You know, would God feel like he could trust me? Mm. But I helped out several other families. Like I said, a mother and son. I helped out another mother and three children. And I helped out one more mother with two girls. Now, I'm not going to lie and say every situation turned out perfect. You're taking strangers into your home. But I did trust and believe that if God put them in my path, he wanted me to honor my word mm -hmm. and do what I promised him I would do. So, you know, some situations didn't turn out the best, but they did move on, you know, to their own places. Long story short, you know, there's hope in God. God can do all things. All things work for his glory. Not some things. You know, I used to think, okay, the good things are going to work out for, you know, so we can tell people about them. The, the blessings, the high times, the top of the world times. But, you know, it's not always like that. But God did show me that as long as there's faith, as long as there's hope, and even though you may have faith, you don't know where you're going. You don't know. You don't know what's ahead. You just know you have God's promise, but sometimes you're a little shaky even on that because how do I know he'll do it for me? God is no respecter of persons. He did it for me. There's hope. Where you find yourself, when you find yourself in a hope, homeless situation, that's not the end. Don't get stuck there because God has bigger plans for you. Thank you. Thank you, Danette. Thank you very much. Um, you know, for being so courageous to share your story with us, because there are others, there's so many others. Uh, I remember Steve Harvey and so many other actors and actors, Tyler Perry, right? Famous people that have told their stories. But what about the nameless folks? 
you know, and as you said, you, you were embarrassed to tell your family, you were ashamed, you were afraid. And that sometimes, I, I, uh, my family and I, we feed the homeless folks who are on the streets, right? And I remember one time my children, I said, what's taking them so long? And they stood there listening to this gentleman who was telling his daughter, I think is an administrator for, I forgot the hospital in the city. And he refused to let his family, he's like, he's going to bring shame to her, you know, but, um, and, and he said he, he had some issues, you know, with his job, he lost his job, so forth, so on. One thing led to another. And with all that, that bothered him. But I want to thank you. As I said, um, I, um, Danette worked at uh, 26 Federal Plaza. And, and you wouldn't think that a working person can be homeless. Uh, I remembered uh, Kyrie, who ran for the bar president's seat, uh, talked about some nurses at Downstate. Nurses, and, I mean, nurses, bona fide nurses that were homeless and working. And, and this is the situation we're living in. So a lot needs to be addressed, you know, and this is not a topic for one night, uh, but uh, we want to bring some light to it and, you know, to let folks be aware, you know, that you can see your neighbor. Someone can be in church with you. Someone can be at work with you and be homeless and you do not know. So as a child of God, as a Christian, when you're led by the spirit of God to be kind to folks and their children, that, you know, sometimes you make an extra meal or you, you, you may be able to afford something, you know, sometimes you can put something in an envelope and give to them because you never know. You really, really never know. But I always say when led by the spirit, we should um, really do what he says. And with that being said, I will now go to Ms. Crystal, who has um, uh, used to give out blessings bag. And I think she also told her son or taught her kids, you know, about blessings bag. Crystal, can you um, come on the screen and share with us about the blessing bags? Are you there? Hello, Crystal? Well, I know uh, her kids have, she, she does have younger kids and they may, I, I know they were doing some homework and things. So, um, Crystal, if you can hear me. Oh, okay, I'm going to give her a quick call. So um, let me just mute myself and give a quick call. Oh, Kamali, if you can put up the pic. Oh, sorry. Just Kamali, can you put up? Um, okay. You know what? Instead, I'm going to let uh, Mrs. Love go to. Um, you can talk about the Wacom exhibit as as we see. Um, uh, Deacon, Mrs. Love. Well, she has many titles, so yeah, I may switch, but she has a lot of titles. Okay. Uh, she volunteered with the Way Home exhibit. And as you saw from the, uh, their homelessness can be solved. It is solvable guys, okay? And so, um, uh, you know, and so she has the testimony and you saw in the clip that we played earlier, um, Channel 2 interviewed her. And so um, I will now turn it over to um, Mrs. Love. Sorry about that. <laughs> Go that's ahead. all right that's all right um yes um good evening everyone um thank you so much uh reverend flo cheng ajita um and thank you miss uh danette also for your uh candidacy um yeah i i got the wonderful opportunity to volunteer with um the prescription home nyc organization um, that uh, that had sponsored the building of the Way Home exhibit. And uh, I was there volunteering, um, escorting people through the exhibit, talking to people um, about uh, homelessness and, and spreading some awareness. And um, 
And I did that for four days and it was a wonderful experience. It was awesome. Um, for me though, it was um, personally sweet um, because I too had experienced homelessness. Um, I was in the shelter system as uh, I uh, gave, um, as I was interviewed and uh, shared a little bit about my experience, I was in the shelter system with my five sons. And like you, uh, Danette, I also was uh, going through divorce. Um, and as you quoted the uh, statistic, yes, 60% of the homeless population in shelters are families. And one third of the entire um, homeless population in shelters are children. So these are families with children. And most of these families are um, single mother uh, led families. Okay, so it's a lot, a lot of women um, with children that uh, experience homelessness for different reasons. Um, uh, um, you know, for, for the various reasons. But um, ever since the 1980s, uh, women with children have become the number one population in the shelter system. Um, when, uh, if you go back through the history of homelessness in this country, um, it goes all the way back to uh, the 1870s, uh, right after the Civil War, yeah. when uh, many people who <laughs> had jobs as part of the um, slave trade and the cotton gin industry um once that uh once the civil war happened and it was determined that you know we were uh, going to abolish slavery for good um many people <laughs> lost their jobs and back then um households were led by uh, men married men who were the prime income earners. Many women were not uh, income earners at all. And so uh, many of these men who were making a living off of uh, the whole, uh, the entire slave trade industry and um, the cotton gin uh, industry, these men were, became homeless and you know, uh, unemployed, homeless. What happened was that many of these men, once they lost their jobs on, and uh, most of the jobs were on the East Coast of the United States. Mm -hmm. So many of them started heading West towards the middle of the country and uh, towards the West Coast in hopes of finding, um, more job opportunities so that they can feed their families back back home. And so these men would go out and um, they were looking for jobs. They didn't have any uh, homes, but um, they slept in different places. Uh, they slept, many of them slept right in the street, uh, along with many of the former enslaved people they too slept in the street. Um, right after the abolishment of uh, slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation, many of the slave owners uh, just simply uh, turned the slaves out, you know, put them out their homes and said, okay, go, you're free now, go. You know, wow. didn't give them any money and no home allowance, nothing. They mm -hmm. just turned them out on the street. And uh, so many of them slept in the street, in the woods, and many, because so many people were sleeping in the street, uh, many of the states in the South uh, began to implement laws that made it illegal to sleep in the street, mm -hmm. okay? And so um, 
these people are sleeping in the street, uh, in the woods, and um, they, they, the police would come and arrest them, throw them in jail. Wow. Uh, simply because they were homeless. And that's, that was the beginning of the association of homelessness with criminality. Mm. Um, and so um, these people were being arrested and uh, the, uh, many of the uh, now freed enslaved people were being locked up, thrown in jail simply because they had no income, they had no job, and so they didn't have to stay. Um, and they were forced to stay in jail unless someone bailed them out. And uh, some of them were bailed out, but then to pay back whoever bailed them out, they would have to work for that person uh, for free to uh, pay them back. So it became a different kind of uh, slavery, you know almost indentured servant type of slavery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so we go from there uh, to sleeping in the street. Then um, uh, 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 people started making uh, what they call flop houses. A flop house yeah. is it's like a hotel, except mm -hmm. um, there's no separate rooms. It's just a big open house that's empty and you took your uh, blanket or whatever, you paid maybe, if you had money, you paid a couple of cents or maybe a dollar and you picked a spot on the floor where you laid down and laid your blanket, you know, and you slept there. Uh, somebody slept next to you, somebody slept next to that person. And, you know, so you would pay for a spot on the floor in the flop house. And you could only be there to sleep, you know, um, not eat there, not live there. You would come there, you would simply lay down. And then when you woke up the next morning, you had to get your uh, things, whatever they were, you didn't have to have, you couldn't have much and get up and get out. And go look for work or go find some place where there was running water where you could wash yourself or what have you. So those were flop houses. Then we went uh, from uh, flop houses from the street and the, in the woods to flop houses. And then we went to from flop houses to um, SROs, single resident occupancies. Yes. Uh, we have the, the we have SROs even today, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the single resident occupancy uh, were uh, houses again, like hotels, uh, but you paid for a single room. The rooms were small, but you had a room. You were given a key, or you had some kind of little. Uh, slide lock on so that you can go in that room, you can put your things in there, um, and no one would come in there and take your things. Um, no, you, you had privacy, you could eat in there, you can sleep in there. Um, you still had to go somewhere to find some water, running water to wash yourself, but um, at least you had your own little space and you didn't have to worry about someone taking your things or um you know sleeping with somebody that you did not know um and everything you had your own little space and um and so those were sros um and then from sros we started getting uh hotels and motels where it's still one room but the one room has a bed in it has you know uh, uh, a place to wash up, you know, in there. Um, and um, it has, you know, a little bit of furniture in there as well. Table and um, chair. Table and chair like that. Yeah. It has a bed or some kind of cot and you yeah. would pay your money um, and you could stay there um, 
you could stay there longer. The thing with the SROs, you could stay there, um, but you had a limited time to be there. Like you could, you could pay by the month, but at the end of the month, if you didn't have the money for next month, you had to get out, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, get gone. You know, otherwise your things would be taken out, and the next person would be there. Um, uh, but in a, a hotel motel setting, you also paid by the week or by the month, like that as well. Um, you could, you 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 didn't, um, you could stay there as long as you had the money to keep uh, paying. Uh, for your stay there. Um, whereas in the SRO, uh, if it got too crowded, you know, um, they would literally, uh, you know, tell somebody, oh, well, we don't have no more room for you. May, um, may, may I interject a little bit? I just want to say that uh, there was a documentary that recently, um, it was also in the news, there was an, uh, an elderly lady that she used to, in California, this happened, where, where folks used to go to a motel, they actually turned that into like a bona fide home for folks who are homeless. And it's, uh, when I tell you folks were crying, folks were, because, you know, like my children were in California and they said there are areas where they're under tents, they're under the bridge. And you know, bridges. And you know, like I said, in within our New York where we are, homelessness is everywhere, by the way. Yes. Everywhere. Yes. Everywhere. everywhere. All over everywhere. the world. Jeanette too. knows Crystal in DC. We went to DC. There were areas that we saw like whole sets of folks on the street. And that's the nation's capital. And yes. so, you know really, as you said about the motels, but it was such a great to know that someone fought for that. The very motels, you know, that they used to, it was different, but now they're actually, they can, it's their home. It has become their home. It's not somewhere where, oh, you have to try to pay, you know, and they can go and, and, and live peacefully and get jobs, you yes. know, and, and, and be humanized again. So thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Continue. Yeah, um, and uh, from, from thanks uh, for that. Uh, California uh, has the highest uh, and the largest population, homeless population in the country. Wow. Okay, um, yeah. yes, uh, in California, uh, California has a, a 40, 44% homeless rate in that Very state. High. Very That's very, very high. Um, in California, you're absolutely right. They have designated areas where people just live in tents and they live in those tents for very long periods of time. Can All I say out something? In, yes. I'm sorry. Here in the South, because I'm from New York, um, in the South, you have entire... I mean, so many people, you know, it's warmer here. So they are in tents, almost all the homeless people. They're under the bridge in their tents and they live there. There's a longevity to, you know, how long that they're staying. I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the, the, there's a, you know, they have, because they've been living, uh, without their own shelter for so long, they actually adapt to living outside in a tent all year round. Um, and they, they survive that, they, it's, a, it's a lifestyle. Um, and these people live um, there and, you know, get up, go to work from there. Yeah. And, you know, go to work, Nobody else knows that they're going home to uh, an outdoor yeah. uh, tent. Nobody knows. Um, like um, uh, Reverend uh, Flo Chengajita stated earlier, um, you, you, homeless, uh, the homeless uh, people are all around us. There is no one face to homelessness. Amen. Um, people are, you know, 
I'm I was so happy that you shared the fact that you had a job, had a pretty good job. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> and you dealt with homelessness, just like the next person. You know, and if and I so, say, mm -hmm. if I can say, I went to work and not one person on my job knew I was homeless. Not one, I no one knew I was homeless. They never knew. Because you, you, there's a tendency for people to look down on you yes. or to think you're less than, like trash or so nobody knew. No one knew. Exactly. Um, there's a very high rate of discrimination against people who don't have their own uh, uh, right. consistent um, dwelling. That's her. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and so. Yeah, because of that, uh, that stigma, that shame, people don't talk about it. Even uh, people who have been through it and came out of it, they don't want to look back at it. They don't want to talk about it. Very unpleasant memories. Um, the shame, the stigma is still there. Yeah, The trauma mm -hmm. of it. That's the one thing that... Uh, Nobody a lot of people about. do not talk about that. It's traumatizing. Uh, for one thing, no one just gives up their dwelling. You know, um, most people who uh, wind up in a shelter or who find themselves homeless, it, it's not by choice. Mm -hmm. uh, usually uh, an extenuating circumstance happened uh, an emergency happened uh, where they had to run to the shelter or had to run to a place where they could have immediate uh, covering, even if it's outside. Okay. And, um, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a dire situation. Um, can I say this too? Sure. That the other thing that I realize is also causing homelessness is gun violence. Mm, yes. Which is another topic that we'll deal about deal with in, in the, another uh, wake the nation. Because, um, you know, it came to my attention where there were certain instances where there was a, a young man killed a, a woman within a young girl in the apartment and there've been many like that. And the families were traumatized because they had to, the body had to lay there until the police and all the investigation was over. And the, um, you know, the, that, what you call it, the more came to take right. the body. Coroner, yeah. The coroner, right, mm -hmm. came to take the body. And so families have been traumatized. And because of that, and, and, and you know, it's not like even within the buildings that they live in NYCHA and some of these other places, they're not willing to give them an, a, another, a different apartment. And so folks have ended up in the shelter also. So I say this, this is, go ahead, Danette. When my sister was murdered in the <laughs> Bronx, my mother was living in the projects. Oh, wow. My sister was murdered in that apartment. And as traumatizing as it was for my mother, she had to stay there or end up homeless. I didn't if she know gave that. up her project apartment, yes, she would have been homeless. So she's to this day living in the apartment that her child was killed in, blood on the walls and stuff. Of course, the blood's not there anymore, but she had to stay there and live there because her other option was homelessness and they didn't have anything else to place her in. Wow. See, wow. I, I mean, we, we may see, you know, and this is why, why I say when God brings a topic and says, deal with it, there is a reason for that. Because there is so many facets to this and so many lives that are in upheaval and so many lives that have been affected. I mean, this is beyond all of us. You know what I mean? And so we really do need the government to really really step in and do something about this because we know that in the bible when in solomon the bible said and he took care of everybody that was subjected 
that were his subjects. So whether you were a resident or you were a stranger, he made allowance for everyone. And, I, and I'm sure the government can do more for what's happening within our countries. Too many people are living up under the elements, the rains, the snow, the floods, you know, and, and when you think about it, also other sets of folks that have been in um, homeless, that have been uh, uh, victims of homelessness are those who've migrated oh, from yes. their countries and have gotten here. You know, I remember meeting someone that came as a refugee and was in college, but wasn't able to complete the, you know, what was happening. And so the college basically threw them out. So where do you go then? And you do Jeez. have folks that are here on the streets because they migrated, but maybe the people that they came to stay with say, oh, you can only stay three weeks or a month. And then bye-bye, find your way out. And their only way out is, was, is the streets, sleeping in the subway, sleeping on park benches. And there should yeah. I, I, I am sure that America as a country can do much more. Yes. Yeah. It, is called, it is not called Wake the Nation for nothing. We could do more. We yeah. can do more. We'll continue, Reverend Love. It, it, it just... <laughs> in, in fact, um, uh, one of the things that I uh, uh, learned from the um, Way Home exhibit is that uh, um, the shelter system um, and the shelters in New York City uh, is a multi-billion dollar industry, okay? Yes, it is. Um, billion wow. would it be? Yes, I just learned that too myself in a meeting I was in. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, and so, yes, America can do a whole lot more, oh, wow. but um, the, the, the question is, do they want to do a whole lot more? Um, and that's the thing. Um, plenty of uh, agencies uh, get a lot of government funding surrounding the shelters and, and, and funneling people through the shelter system, okay? Um, when people uh, go into the shelter system, they are not only in need of uh, a, a, an abode. Uh, many of them, they need jobs. They need an income. They need food. Counseling. Counseling. Yes. Right. Medical yeah. care. Counseling, yes. And medical and, care. And, right. Medical care, counseling. Child um, care. Child care. Yeah. Uh, life skills. Yes. Uh, because a lot of times, especially when there's young people yeah. that uh, are in the shelters, they are there, they don't have life skills to uh, help them to be uh, marketable for a job or go on a job interview or even, you know, you get them in an apartment, but they don't know how to cook, you know, so, you know, these different or things is a basic life skill. Yeah. Uh, right, I'll pay a bill, right, budgeting, yeah. Um, oh, oh, and, oh, we need to write this down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, but, um, you know, it's so many things when people- Production, write it down, please, thank you. Right, it's so many, pe so many things that people are in need of when they show up at the shelter. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when they go, they don't just- um, fill out paperwork for an apartment. They fill out paperwork for everything, all the social services yeah. that they may need um, that's available to them. And so they, it's a lot of paperwork and you have to have the mental wherewithal to be able to deal with writing, you know, filling out all of these questionnaires and all of these forms. Uh, and then you know, you, you have to have proof for this and proof for that. And, you know, bring the stuff, the pay stub and affidavits and all of these things to prove that what you're saying and what you're requesting true. is true. 
Um, and, uh, you know, in doing all of that, it, it's, it's a lot and you have to do it over and over and over again. Sometimes you have to fill out um, an income affidavit, you know, for like five different agencies. You know, they asking the same question, but, um, you know, uh, because that's the, the first form is for this agency over here and uh, that agency over there has similar um, resources, but agency over here and agency over there don't communicate. So you have to fill out the same form over yeah. and over again so that everybody uh, can uh, look at your form and determine your eligibility for those same services over and over and over again. So it's redundant. And so, um, so, so may I ask a question here? Sure. Is this done to frustrate certain groups of people? I, I ask this because we live in Brooklyn, both you and I currently. Right. And I'm aware that within certain sections of Brooklyn, there are shelters, but certain races are not allowed in certain shelters that are in certain areas. Area. And that red tape and whole, one of the things that I found out was the 500 days that it takes for someone to possibly be given a home, not even, it's not a guarantee that at right. the end of 500 days, now 500 mm -hmm. days you've done spent what? How many days is in a year? Come on. That's almost 365 year. Year, days, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you spent almost two years in a shelter. And at the end of almost two years, you're not guaranteed to be approved to get okay. an apartment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the purpose? And as you said, that I found out I was just in a meeting and when I heard the number for the billions of dollars that was given, I was like, oh, okay. So why, why are things the way they are? Also, NYCHA was just given $35 billion. Mm -hmm. And the yep. 5 billion they had before, they did nothing. Buildings are falling apart. We yep. see it every day in the news. So there needs to be a whole overall because seriously, is it that we need new people in place to implement or what? But people that care. Systems are broken. Yes, people we do not people care. Really care. And systems are broken and need to be fixed. Something has to be done. Like we cannot be like uh, hamsters on the wheel. Just keep. Same thing over and over. Right. Madness, it, isn't that, isn't so that what, what is labeled insanity so yeah. we need changes so we're we're doing this because we need changes and you know really uh and can i elected. say something go ahead i don't know what the shelter system is like today especially there up north mm -hmm. but back when i was trying to get in you had to get there early and we would sit it would be packed. Sometimes we would sit on the floor all day, <gasps> filling out paperwork. Yes. And then by the end yep. of the day, sometimes they send you home yep. because they don't have a place to place you at that moment. So then you come back the next. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, send you home to where? If yes. You're homeless. Oh, nowhere. They tell you to get go. Right. Come, back, come the back the next day. Next day. And if you leave, you lose your spot. So you and your kids are sitting on the floor. Yes. all day long yes. and only to be found out that we can't help you today you done filled out all yep. of this paperwork you've gone through all of this red tape only to be told i've been there crying desperate i mean even trying to make myself stand out with the fact that i have a job i just need housing and day after day i'm coming back only to be told not today so yeah. I don't know what it's like now, but they make it so, yes, it is. so, so dehumanizing. Yes, it still is. And it's worse. Um, I was in, I, I went through the uh, shelter system back in 2006 and um, 
the I had a friend of mine uh, that drove me up to the Bronx to Path, yeah. which is the the headquarters, the shelter headquarters for New York City, the five boroughs. And uh, she was familiar with the whole situation there. I had not a clue. Mm. Uh, she drove me there, me with my five sons. We were there eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. We were there all day. Yeah. Okay. And they don't um, feed you. They I was don't just feed going you. to ask, do they feed you? No, nothing. No, no. I had a few snacks, you know, for my kids. Um, I'm thinking that oh, okay, I'll be there for a couple of hours, and then they're going to place me, and you know, um, we'll go on. I got there eight o'clock in the morning. We did not uh, get uh, get to the shelter um, until eleven thirty that night. Okay, my children were tired they were hungry they were yep. sleepy we were on a we were there on a saturday morning okay and um we we were we were there all day but we were fortunate enough that before the day was over that night we wound up you know having a place to lay our heads there were many families there with children that were turned away, many families that were there that um, with children that were hungry, um, people were, um, you know, disabled. They had to be right there. The room was crowded. It was hot. People were hungry. Um, the way I got through the day was it was like, you know, some of us mothers with small children, we were online together um and and so we would take turns and um mm -hmm. there was a, a a vending machine there and we would you know step off the line ask the other mother could you hold my spot and go to the vending machine and just kind of get whatever little chips or whatever they had there until the vending machine was empty okay yeah. and we would share amongst all of our children, the, the little snacks or whatever that we had. I remember getting the, the, um, the little uh, peanut butter cookies, the cheese yeah. peanut butter cookies or something. It come like with four in there. And so I had five mm -hmm. children. So mm -hmm. each one, I, I bought two so that each one would at least have one. Mm -hmm. And then with the other three left over, I gave those to the next mother who had maybe three children like that. And we oh, were sharing goodness, our, our yep. little snacks like that so that at least our children had something on their bellies. The mothers stomach. didn't eat at all. The mothers didn't eat something? at all. Go ahead. Sure. I was, so imagine I have a job, but they're not going to take that into account. So they're asking me to take off work in order to sit there all day long. And then at the end of the day, I still don't have housing and I've missed a day of work, which is money out of my pocket. It's no, it's nothing in the system where they say, okay, these people have jobs. So we're just going to take their paperwork, let them go to work. No. So every day that I'm there, I'm crying. I have anxiety because yeah. not only am I missing money, am I going to be able to keep my job? Because I right. have to be here and they want you to be there. So now you're taking off days from your job, money out of your kid's mouth, and there's no guarantee that you're going to be placed in housing that day or that night. And there's some of the locations where they place you. One place that me and my kids were put was dangerous. <gasps> it was just all kinds of elements there. My, my oldest daughter got cut in her face. They, some people were in their fight to this day she remembers they were in there fighting wow. I was coming in from work and I was just trying to get past to get to my room and my daughter ended up getting cut in her face so Jeez. I mean so wait a minute you had to go to the hospital with her then yes but by then we had this is when we were placed in a shelter and they wow. were in there fighting yes so 
lady inside the family shelter stuff happens so oh, yeah. yeah you know of- i have when we feed what my family and i we go to feed the homeless and so we've gone to feed folks that are literally outside their shelter and or i should say outside of a shelter but refuse yep. to go inside the shelter because they say they feel safer on the streets. I don't yeah. think it should be that way because that is even more dehumanizing than anything else. I've always considered that a home should be somewhere where you feel safe. So whether it's that it's a shelter or it's your house or your apartment or you're staying with someone, a home should always be a haven of safety. In the Bible, in biblical times, they used to have that city of refuge where you yes. were allowed to come in and be safe. You, they would feed you, ensure your safety, that no one would harm you in that city of refuge. And I think this is what the shelter should be, that there should be, they should be a, a, a safe haven for those who, like you, think about it, that if you have gone through something as traumatic as a divorce, you, you've split up from your spouse, your children are ripped from their home, should they be then left up to where, oh, you can get hurt or you literally get hurt? Or you, you, you've left a domestic violence situation. Yeah. And you enter into a shelter and you're thinking, well, at least I should be safe here, but you're not. Right. No, I think, ladies, we need to pen a letter or something to, to, to the highest office in the land because it's not a new york thing it's not an atlanta thing no, it's not no. a california thing it's an america thing yeah it's an entire nation problem so something better has to be done because i'm thinking that we can humanize shelters more that even when families are seeking like has the net suggested, and I like that suggestion. If 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 as a parent you have a job, then make that process a little smoother so that person doesn't lose their job. If you, families have to be there a whole day, how about partnering with companies that provide food, lunch, dinner, even for the people that are waiting all day? Yeah. So, uh, and and elected officials, if you're hearing this, please, and ladies, I think we should pen some letters. Seriously, because, you know, that's just what came to my mind. Anyway, continue. There there (laughs) are so many different things that can be done just to uh, make the entire shelter system more streamlined and efficient. for example, um, we have shelters in all five boroughs, and there are uh, different types of shelters um, also. Um, and and but if you want to get into a shelter, period, you have to go to the shelter headquarters up in the Bronx, Path, P A T H. Um, that I forgot what is the letter stand for but that's at uh 151 east 151st street okay everybody got to go there first and then they send you out to the different process. shelters in in the um the process yeah it's a the path is the processing center um so, man, where, for all question. shelters uh, just to come in and go back to that Sure. Because as an educator, when I taught here in Brooklyn, so many kids were being bused to and from the Bronx to come to school in Brooklyn. Why is that? Because their shelter uh, was probably in the Bronx. And even though they had, they were registered for school in Brooklyn. Uh, when I was in the shelter, my five children and I, we were, we went into shelter from Brooklyn, but we were placed in a queen shelter. Okay. So every day my um, 
my older sons, particularly my two older sons, one was in high school, one was in junior high school. They would take the train from the last stop on the F train in Queens um, all the way to uh, Brooklyn. One had to go to his high school was downtown Brooklyn. And the other one's junior high school was in Bedford Stuyvesant. And they did that every single day. They went to school and they came back the same way on the trains, you know, um, now, um, you know, one of the uh, suggestions that uh, Prescription Home uh, NYC made was that instead of having only one central headquarters all the way up in the Bronx, why not have uh, uh, a headquarters for all the shelters that's in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, in all the shelters that's in Queens, in Queens, all the shelters that's in the Bronx, in the Bronx, right. like that, so that, you know, you can kind of move people around a lot faster, and you can still have right. the Bronx be the coordinating Flagship. headquarters, yeah, right, was, yeah. but at least if you have uh, a headquarters in each borough, the headquarters can talk to each other. So the Bronx wouldn't have to go through all of the shelters across the whole five boroughs to see who has beds available uh, for people. They could just call the um, headquarters in Brooklyn and say, how many beds do you have available tonight? You know, I got, you know, so-and-so amount of people or so-and-so amount of families, you know, and I want to send them to Brooklyn, you know, like that. And, you know, it just takes uh, coordination of the communication, you know, and then people won't have to spend the whole day in the processing center up in the Bronx, you know, um, and they put you wherever, you know, wherever a bed is available, okay? Um, and there are all different kinds of shelters. Yeah, okay. I yeah. was in a family. I was in a family shelter, um, but there, there, there are different kinds of shelters. There are um, but that makes sense. They because have the yeah, ones for the, the ones for people with domestic mean, violence. Those shelters are unregistered, or their addresses are known, or something to that effect. Their, that their makes addresses sense. are not. Their addresses it's are not announced. printed. Right. It's in Georgia, printed. in Georgia, the battered woman shelters. You don't know you, the cops. You have to call the cops nine one one, and then they take you to the location because the location has to stay confidential yeah. so that the abuser yeah. cannot locate the abused. Right. Yeah, that's it's the same way here in New York also, mm -hmm. um, okay. and they require that the um, the the person or family that's going into the domestic violence shelter, they're supposed to uh, cut off all ties uh, yes. to their abuser, you know, but many women, um, you know, they Good still life. have phone contact with their abuser. And then when she uh, breaches the address of the location, then they have to take her out of that location and move her to another location to, See, to guarantee Georgia, the safety. Mm -hmm. In Georgia, if they breach the location, they're just homeless. They're just on their own. They're done. This is why, <sighs> this is why there need to be counseling. Yes. Because if you're not getting counseling, because we know that when someone has been abused. Yes. Yeah, they're going to be, they're going to go and, through and, and many times, see, abusers are manipulative. There are times when they will make the abused feel guilty, sorry for them, guilty yeah. of what they've done and all of that. So, oh. yeah, it's a lot of times, abuser will withhold finances that a lot of times the abuser will withhold finances and even though she's not supposed to be in touch with him when your kids are hungry you do what you have to do you know what i'm yeah. saying when, mm -hmm. i mean to survive you do what you have to do so a lot of times the abuser has this in mind that if 
they withhold the finances, you'll stay in touch with them for the finances and then eventually they'll find out where you are and their hopes are that you will get kicked out because then you have to come running back exactly mm-hmm. and and that's the nature of financial abuse which yes, is yeah. very uh a, a very common me too um a very common reason why many uh women with children stay with their abuser or yep. stay connected to their abuser because they need that financial, um, they need their fi- access to finances and they get further abused. Um, yep. but, you know, even after, <laughs> excuse me, God bless me. Um, they get further abused just so that they can get whatever monies, you know, that they can get. Um, and a lot so of that times, they can feed the families. Sorry. A mm, lot of times okay. when you go back, because they know your intentions are to leave them, a lot of times you're putting your life on the line when you go back or when you give them the address to your shelter, because they know that your first chance you get, you're out of there again. So this time, they a lot of them will try to take your life or do you some serious harm so that you can't leave this time because they're afraid one of those times that you leave, they won't be able to find you. You won't contact them. You won't know where they are. So the, so it's like putting yourself in even more danger by contacting your abuser for the finances. Yes. And the other exactly. thing I just thought of as you were speaking, Danette, is when uh, women, If you know that you're in a shelter for domestic violence, please do not breach that because think about it. If one person knows, you're also endangering other women and children's lives. And that's the reason that they tell you when you come in that you have to keep the identity of those that are in there, the battered woman shelter. You have to keep the identity of the other ladies in there private. Like, let's say, for instance, a celebrity goes in, you know, if that gets out, then they know where to find them. Not only do they know where to find them, but that abuser now knows where a battered woman's location is. So if they run into other men that are abusers and they're looking for their wives, they can now say, oh, there's one on 200 and whatever street. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. And uh, but it, that that's easier said than done. Um, again, these these uh, women, these uh, uh, victims, survivors, they are already in desperate straits. Yes. Coming into the shelter. Yes. OK. Um, and they're still fighting to survive what yes. they already ran from. And, and then for so them scared. to have to go back, because yeah. when you're in the shelter, um, you have to sit in the shelter for 90 days, uh, doing nothing, sometimes having zero services, because it takes them 90 days to determine what services you are actually eligible for. Three months. Okay. Three months. Three months. So wow. out of that 500 uh to 520 days on average 90 of those days is spent without services you're just sitting in the shelter waiting for them to determine what you're actually eligible for so in those 90 days they're reading yeah three months in those 90 days they're reading all of those forms that you filled out when you went up to path the processing center in those 90 days the uh you know agency a over here it, it, you know is is uh looking at your eligibility while agency c over here uh already decided that you're not eligible not, for yeah, what they yeah, have but yeah. they passed you over to you know a- agency x you know, they pass your information over there. So then agency X got to cross-reference with agency A and all of this stuff. And so all of that 
passing around of the paperwork uh, just to determine what you're eligible for, um, that it takes 90 days at least, at so, least. So in this day and age, when we're in the age of technology, is there some kind of a system that can be changed uh, where things can be streamlined or you know, Anything like how with, with, with the, um, your medical records then, right? So it goes into the system and your doctor, if you were in the hospital, your doctor will know because they can go into that system and see. So shouldn't there be like that within that agency itself? Or, you know, to say, you know, if services, A, B, and so it goes much faster. Right. And um, that old. Looks three months but yeah. as i said um this topic is uh, something that you know we have to revisit at another time and i uh, see time is is coming up but um crystal <laughs> can you unmute and, and come on in and share with us i wanted uh she does the blessings bag can you come in and tell us how you guys started and what goes into what makes a blessing bag and you know this is the holiday time. And I, I know during Thanksgiving and Christmas time, a lot of people get very, you know, joyful and in, in the spirit of giving and share, sharing. So <laughs> I think this is a great time to introduce this. But let's remember that homelessness is not only just at Thanksgiving, not only just at Christmas, it's every day for each person that's out there on the street. So whenever you can, if you can afford to, how about making a blessing bag? So go ahead, Ms. Crystal, can you come on in? Hi, so it's just something that started because again, um, you know, people experience this homeless all year round and it was just something that um, I could do at home with the kids. So if you want to teach your kids service, this is really something that they can um, really enjoy to do at home. Um, and I will say that I've, I've put in the chat some of the things that I use in the blessing bags. Um, they're kind of, they're kind of, sorry. They're kind of, um, it's really simple. You can make some for women and some specifically for men. If you wanna do a bigger bag, I usually just use a gallon size of black bags. I prefer the slider bags, but um, some things you can include are socks, toothbrush and toothpaste, um, snacks such as like applesauce, peanut butter crackers, granola bar, mints. I think um, especially in the winter, lip balm is very important. Maybe a small first aid kit. And if you can't find the small ones in the store, I usually use like leftover pill bottles or like those sort of um, round empty containers to put like band-aids and, and little uh, some Advil or things like that. Um, of course, for women, sanitary um, napkins are important. Um, face or body wipes, if you can, a washcloth, hand sanitizer, of course, face masks are important now. It's an additional item that I didn't have in there before that I have to have now. Um, if you can, get maybe a bottle of water, dental floss, a comb, plastic spoon and fork, uh, shampoo, soap, deodorant, sunscreen, hat, gloves, hand and foot warmers. And it's also, this, this, is, this bag right here is directed towards people experiencing homelessness. Um, but there are other opportunities to serve and to teach your kids at home to serve. And those are like finding a local organizations that will help children in shelters or children in adoption centers and foster care um, so that when they enter, there are bags that are made specifically for not just girl and boy, but for each age group. They might include a teddy bear, pajamas for whatever age you're trying to serve or you know, whatever age the organization needs the most that you're partnering with. But um, so let's not just think adults, but um, you can also, you know, sort of uh, be rotated and you use it directly for children, because I did hear that a third of the, what did you say, one a third of them are children? Third. Yes. Third. And, I'll, yes. Uh, and to that point, I'll say also that um, that is because children can be used as pawns in the homeless system, because you get through quicker if you have a child. 
Yes. They all know how long it takes to get assistance. Um, so people will take other people's children or additional children and, you know, uh, fraudulently use children to get through the system. Oh, wow. Yeah. Didn't but, know that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Can we that. see the bag, the blessing bag? I Just don't say. have any right now. I actually oh, okay. dropped off a bunch of them last weekend at a, an event that I did, um, which I brought my children to. We also do things like um, there's a, a line, the Project Linus. Um, I'm in Maryland, so that's more local to my area. But I'm sure in anyone's area, there are charities that you can partner with which is, you know, blankets for the homeless. And I pretty much just take a, a heavy piece of fleece from the fabric store. I buy about 10 yards and I'm just cutting two yards of blankets and um, fraying the ends or making sure that they don't, you know, come apart. Um, but there's plenty of opportunities. There's also opportunities for people in uh, experiencing in the hospital, experiencing homelessness. Yes, um, yes. Mm -hmm. A teddy bear can be so helpful in those instances. So um, there's many different ways that we can, but I wish you, you're right. I should have had a bag, but we actually just dropped them off last week, last Saturday. That's true. I can, I can. Yeah. Tell them some of the other charities, the Chick-fil-A charity that maybe there are those in Atlanta that the net, because on here are all givers. We all do for the homeless throughout the year. We don't just wait until any particular time. And one of the, tell them, so she has, listen, there are many, they're, they're, they have a, tell them about the one that, where you went to decorate or make for the, was it Make-A-Wish when they took them to the oh, airport? That, oh, I think you're talking about the one in the airport? Yes, the one in the airport and That's also this Chick-fil-A with the bags where they, where you, you buy the pajamas for kids that are so tell them about both. Yeah, yeah, that's actually the one I was just mentioning. It, it was um, for children um, just coming into the foster care system. So they sort of feel at home and it's um, they're called backpacks of love. And you fill a backpack that they can use, keep and carry with them all their items because when children usually come into the system, they usually have nothing. Um, so just a teddy bear, a pair of pajamas, sort of similar to what you put in an adult blessing bag, socks, you know, a couple of snacks, but children, you want to pivot, you might want to put a notebook, some crayons, a toy, maybe even um, an extra pair of clothes. And I would suggest if you're going to do clothes for children, just do things that are elastic pants, elastic waist pants, because you don't yeah. know. I mean, a six-year-old isn't always a typical size six. <laughs> so um, a, you really want to think uh, think about, you know, the flexibility and whatever you're putting in the, the backpacks of love. Um, there are um, different things like um, we made jump ropes using t-shirts. Um, we've done book drives where um, if you have any um, like uh, gently used books, those are dropped off to an organization out here called BIG, and they also work with um, homeless shelters to distribute the books to children and, you know, sort of create those libraries in, in different places. Um, there are, I'm trying to think of everything. <clears throat> Of course, there was the one for people in hospice, which is where we did the teddy bear. So we got to build a bear. We did stories. We named him, we put pictures in there. So that person in hospice feels like they have a family, like they have love. You know, it, it's something that they can connect with and brings them a little joy in, you know, their what what their what seems to be their last days. Um, there's also some things that for the firehouses, local um, volunteer firehouses for like the, um, their Thanksgiving um, dinner for those who are stuck, you know, at work at the firehouse for um, the holidays, just volunteering to bring a meal to them or something, uh, let me think. Of course, there's always blood drives Blood is always needed. There are always needed. 
yes, gently use cults. Cult if you have drive. any gently used cults, yeah. find an organization that will take some gently used cults because we all know it's it's getting it's cold and it's getting colder. Yeah. So even if you don't give it to an organization, I think if you're doing the blessing bags, it might be a great idea to have a coat in the car. Yeah. You know, a coat or two when you drop me something off, if you see someone that, you know, that may need that. And the other one that I did that was that was really rewarding was with United Airlines. And they do a thing called um, 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 what's it called? Um, fantasy flight. So yeah. what they do, they have they partner with an organization. I don't remember the name of the organization. They did it out here in um, the Dulles Airport. And um, we spent a week decorating one terminal of United in Dulles Airport and back and forth. The terminal was still in use while we were decorating it. And this was about four years ago. They haven't done it in a while. Um, days for them to, uh, it was a Saturday, they find children that are terminally ill and they give them a fantasy flight. So they take them to from one terminal and then they fly them in the air for an hour. And then we're all preparing the terminal. There's gifts, all kinds of uh, gifts. Warner Brothers partner with us. We had all sorts of gifts. The, um, the National Guard was there, local teams, the news. I mean, it was, it was really beautiful. Um, they, then they fly them into a different terminal and that's the terminal that we decorated. And it was, they were in the North Pole. So they got to see Santa and it's really beautiful, especially because, you know, a lot of these kids have tubes coming out of them. You know, you could see the stitches, um, all over their face, heads, bodies, you know, children with disabilities, but, um, and they did it pretty early. They did it um, end of October, um, just to make sure it was done before the holidays. But um, the Santa that was there was the best Santa ever. He went to every child. He, and, and mind you, I don't believe in Santa, not promoting that, but I do believe in bringing that they brought, it was a project that definitely brought joy yes. to children who needed it. So um, it was a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work, but it was, it's definitely, um, it was definitely a rewarding experience. Yeah, thank, thank you, Crystal. Crystal's <laughs> always volunteering and as, as she says, you know, and we can really do, my, my kids and I, myself, and we're always doing my, my entire family. I say my kids and I, my husband, also does you know but for the most part he's usually at work and he gives me the vehicle and the kids and I we go but uh <laughs> yeah um we uh and, and 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 my daughter and I we've gone to the women's shelter there's a women's shelter in in Brooklyn and by the anyway I don't know if it's one that should not be announced. So let me not say, don't know. So anyway, but we've been to different shelters. We've been to the shelter for the men. We've been to the shelter for the women. No, seriously. And we've gone there and we've just asked, what do they need? You know, like, is there anyone in need? And there are times when we've brought things to them. And my daughter and I, something that um, Novlet Thompson um suggested instead of throwing away your pocketbooks how about giving it to the homeless and so my daughter and I we went to Target and we bought you know the sanitary you know feminine products and things for women and we with t-shirts and things and other things and we literally put them in the bags because sometimes you have the bag but you're not using it and it's not that the bag is anything's wrong with the bag but you're not using it yep. and my daughter <laughs> believes in uh she's a minimalist so she really downsizes seriously she downsizes <laughs> so um um so okay so um and kamali if you can post the um the blessing bag on facebook for me production thank you um <laughs> so um yeah 
if you could do that, thank you. But the thing about it is, as I said, we don't have to sit still and say, oh, you know, we have clothing. Sometimes we have clothing in our closet. My daughter taught me to do this. She's like, listen, if you're going to bring something new in, then you need to give something out. <laughs> are you wearing everything <laughs> no seriously no like seriously she's gone through my closet for me and, and she was like um when was the last time you wore this and i was like wait i forgot that was there she said oh that goes <laughs> no but seriously like i'm sharing this with everyone listen we can seriously do this. We can have things in the back of our closet that's been there four, five, six years. We haven't worn it. And, and the moment we see it, wait, we're like, oh, yeah, I want it. But we weren't <laughs> using it. Why not share it? And so uh, I've called up. Um, we donated uh, gowns that we had for young women uh, for graduation right you have uh uh dry cleaners you have tailors that take them and can remake them into something you know it, it, sometimes you think something is outdated even wedding gowns that people really don't want to see anymore they will dye it and they will change it into a prom dress and so it's amazing. There are many organizations out here. Um, I partnered up. I, I, I called up some of my friends. I said, listen, do you have a barber who's willing to cut young men here for their graduation? And they were willing to do it. People paid and all the young men had to do was walk into that barber shop. They got set. Hairdressers. That will do. There's so many things we can do to help each other because the struggle is real for each and every one of us. And growing up, you know, there's a saying in Jamaica, one, one cocoa full basket. <laughs> so it means if each person, everybody, like one of us may not be able to sponsor even a child, but if I say, listen to each of us on here, let's all put $10 together. Each of us in here, that's $50 right there to give to someone. You see what I'm saying? And if it was $20, that's $100. And you know how far $100, well, not, not very far. Price of food has gone up. Everything has gone up. Everything gone up. But, but it helps. That's the point. So with that being said, as we come to the closing, um, uh, or maybe if can you come get my phone, please, and then you can post it on my Facebook page. Thank you. <laughs> so, with that being said, um, yeah, thank you, ladies, for joining and for sharing. For I that. learned more, and I'm sure we all learned something new. And uh, for those who are watching, and seriously, if you're out there. Um, if you are one that um, like to pen letters or if you, what's the people that go to Washington again, uh, Crystal and Danette and Deacon Love production, what's the name of the people who go and advocates? The, yeah, they're advocates, but you know, ambassadors. No, no, no. Was, there's a word. Anyway, it will come, but <laughs> you know, let's um, filibusters. No, no, not those. Uh, they go to to try to get Washington to 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 do for others. Th those ones. So it, for some reason, it just it, let me tell you something. Right now, my brain is in overdrive because I am like, what can be done? But things need to be done. So I'm thinking of a bunch of people to contact, uh, like right now and everything, but uh, Mr. Mayor-elect and everyone, please uh, see if there's a way to make shelters safer, provide food for families when they're spending time trying to find shelter and, and, and just so much, you know, ladies, listen, let's all pen a letter. So I'll start it, I'll email you. And at the end of the day, we'll get it sent off to Washington somehow, some way. We'll find a senator or a congressperson through whom, you know, 
something can be done because this is really bigger than all of us. It's an entire nation's problem. And because it is a nation's problem, it's even the world's problem. See, there's a world map. It's the world's problem. It's not just, but we're talking, let's just start even in each of the neck of the woods that we're in. So if we can give blessing bags, if lobbyists, thank you. <laughs> if we can, <laughs> yeah. So if we can help, you know, even our neighbors, sometimes our neighbors don't have, we have neighbors with kids. We see them with many kids and we don't reach out and say, hey, you know, um, there's a fire. And, and, and maybe, you know, we see the people, we can say, hey, have you been displaced? Do you need help? Do you need something? We can always share. I'm telling you, when you go to the supermarket, you can buy a little extra groceries. We've all done it. You know, I've done it time and time again. You, you see somebody, you know, my grandmother always taught me if, if, if it's one banana I have, and there are five people. I need to cut that banana in five pieces, okay? So <laughs> because of all that was ingrained in me, I'm always giving, and I, and I thank you ladies on here because I know each and every one of you have loving, really giving hearts. And uh, all the experiences that you guys have had, you know, we've all gone through things. Not all of us have been through shelters. Some of you have been, some of us have been through the shelters. Some of us have not, but whatever it is, you know, we count it all a blessing that God has provided for us, taking us from places, okay? And, um, you know, and he, trust, he's there for each and every one of us. So I wanna thank each and every one for joining in to Wake the Nation and I, do hope that if you've been displaced from your home, if you've been traumatized, if you feel anxious, if you are depressed, know that there is hope. And as a child of God and a minister, I can say, trust God, pray. You heard Danette say it. And she was true to her word. She did. I've, I've been to her dog. She, she, and, and, and she prayed. She made a promise to God. And she fulfilled the promise. She really helped other women, single women who were homeless. And as she said, she's being true to her word. Not everybody, all the experiences weren't great. Some were, some weren't, but God, he honored, you know, he says he honors motives. When your heart is pure and your hands are clean and you do, God will always bless it. No matter how the enemy tries to come in and tries to muddle it up. So Absolutely. don't stop, right? Don't stop being good. Don't stop being kind. Don't stop being empathetic towards others because they're but for the grace of God. And so with that being said, I want to thank you. I want to ask, is there any last word that each of you ladies have? And make sure you do your blessing bags. And we're going to post that also on the Facebook as well, and it will be, I'll put it in on the YouTube as pages uh, channel as well. So um, any last words from you ladies? I just wanted to say um, thank you. Um, thank you, Crystal, um, for the blessing bags. Um, and as a um, even when I was in the shelter, there were days when I had no money on me. I only had my Metro card, um, yep. taking my children to an appointment wow. or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't have any money on me. I remember being on the subway uh, with my five kids and knowing that I had I spent my, used my last fare that was on my Metro car. Yeah. And I was on my way um, back to the shelter and I didn't have any money. And I was sitting there thinking, what am I going to get my children to eat tonight? I don't oh, have any yeah. money. And um, I, while I'm on the train and I'm sitting there and my children are sitting, you know, next to me and everything. And they're just, you know, I, 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 I 
encourage them to, you know, um, be, you know, be upbeat, you know, be happy, you know, and they were just glad to be out, you know, and they're with mom. They, you know, we had um, did some uh, went to our, uh, our appointment and all that kind of stuff. And now we're on our way back to the shelter and um, I didn't have any money. And while I was sitting there, there was uh, a lady sitting across from us and she's looking at me with my five boys and she's waving. And I, I don't, I forget which one uh, was waving back at her and smiling. And she was like, um, when she got ready, when we got ready to get off of the train, she walked up to me and she said, hello, are all of these your children? And I said, yes. And she said, um, they're beautiful. And then uh, she said, can I shake your hand? And uh, she said, because you, 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 you obviously are doing a wonderful job. And so she said, I'd like to shake your hand. So I stuck my hand out. And she stuck her hand out, you know, to shake my hand and she pressed money in my hand. And I, when she was shaking my hand, I felt something in my hand. And then she was like, God bless you. And she got off the train. She went wow. one way. I went the next. Um, I knew that there was something in my hand. I thought, well, maybe a dollar, maybe five dollars. I opened my hand. I was walking, um, uh, getting ready to come out of the train station with my children, and I'm walking. And I looked, I opened my hand and looked down in my hand, and she had pressed um it was a it was a, a twenty dollar bill in my hand. And I looked at that. That was enough to feed, you know, myself, my children uh, mm -hmm. for that evening um, and even for the next day. And when I opened my hand and I looked and I saw it was a $20 bill, my kids could tell you, I stopped and I said, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. And I just threw my hands up and started shouting because I knew that God had provided only God yes. knew that I was going back to the shelter with nothing, nothing in my pocketbook. Only God knew that. And something was placed on that woman's heart where she saw us and she decided, I, I didn't even see when she took it out or anything. And she was like, can I shake your hand? And when she shook my hand, she pressed money in my hand. And I mean, that just, I can't tell you how the joy, you know, um, it, it, it just really blessed me that somebody care, um, that it showed me that God is still there. And so uh, with things like the blessing bag and things of that nature um, and giving to those who are less fortunate, you know, it's a great pick me up. It could mean the, the difference between life and death for someone. Um, That's true. That's true. um, you know, just knowing that, okay, somebody sees me, somebody cared enough to, you know, do something nice for me or, or, you know, meet a need that I obviously have, you know, and so, uh, thank you all ladies, uh, for, um, what you do, uh, what you're doing, uh, because it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Now I, you know, I wish that I could have seen that person, you know, a little bit longer. I want to, you know, go back to them and say, thank you. Do You don't know how you right. fed my, my family that day. Um, but I guess it wasn't meant for me to be able to cross that person's path again. Um, okay. But I can pay, I can, I can do it now for somebody else. Mm -hmm. I can pay it forward. Amen. Um, yes. So, you know, yeah, that's, I uh, thank you for letting me share. <laughs> no, you know? thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing. And, and one thing that remember I, we, I used to do when I used to, when I first started the bags, I didn't have this long list. I used to put a $5 bill in each bag and a calling card because someone could literally be a phone call away 
from getting that help, reaching out to a family member, and they can use any, you know, phone. I, you know, I don't know why I did a calling card, but that's just what God had put on my heart at the time. This was years ago when we started. It was like like 13, 14 years ago, mom. Yeah. <laughs> When we started doing it, yeah, five dollar mm-hmm. gift card, a five dollar mm-hmm. calling card, and a five dollar bill. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. I, I just want to show some of the 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 things that we're getting ready to. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> These are the socks. They're really warm. Different shirts. They're really nice. They're even some polar shirts. <laughs> For real. Nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's a whole bunch that we're getting ready to to give out. And what I, my family and I have done, um, and we've given out. I usually give out a little. I haven't done it yet. I'm going to do that um, this year. Oh, Molly, can you bring the Bible? We also got some Bibles. Okay. Can't find them right now. But um, we also have Bibles that we're giving out. But um, for the ones who won't get Bibles, I usually give little cards. So I print scriptures and I give it. And can I tell you, invariably, <laughs> someone would read the card read the scripture and said, how did you know? I'm telling you, God is amazing. And I would put the, the card the, in, in, in an envelope with $5 and one year, my eldest son said to me, mom, let's do tens and twenties. <laughs> and I don't know where God gave it from, but he gave it. <laughs> we came out about 50 bags. <laughs> <laughs> listen uh, my, my birthday gift uh, all of that listen you know i am that person it's what i do according to how the lord leads and it blesses you so when you know that because i know that i will always have food i have clothes to wear i have a roof over my head And I give God thanks. And so for those who don't, you know, why not do what I can to help them? We 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 bought blankets, we've gone to Sears and Target, we've given out blankets. One year my son gave out sneakers, brand new sneakers. Folks were like, wait, y'all have a store? (laughs) They were like chaplain. Yes, God has, yeah, God, God is rich. He owns everything. Our daddy God, girl, you know this, but I want to share this before I close. My son, my eldest son, he was on the train one day and he had just, he was working for someone and um, he had just cashed his check and he was on the train and Someone said, um, the Holy Spirit said to him, give your entire money that you just cashed to a lady that was on the train. He wasn't getting off where she got off. But when she got off the train, he got off because the Lord told him to do it. And he went up to her and handed her because it was still in the, you know, the little envelope they would give you in the bank. It was in that envelope. And he told her that God loves her and he walked away. So he walked away because he needed to continue on his journey. So he was going to take the train and he thought that she was leaving, but he kind of didn't want it to be a, you know, like an awkward situation because he was like, he didn't know how she was taking it. He's a young man. And here he is giving a woman that he doesn't know. So he didn't want her to think, you know, so he walked away. He walked a little further down. And he said, as he was walking away, she called him back. She, she's like, hey, hey, hey. And he turned around and he looked and she was running towards him because she probably thought he was going down the other set of steps. And he said, 
and I'll never forget this. He said she was crying. He said she was about to be evicted. And that was going to cover. Wow. I'm telling you, and, and that's just urging, you know, me just letting you know that when the Holy Spirit tells you or impresses upon you to do something, just yeah. do it because God will take care of you. He will provide for you. He will take care of your needs. When we're obedient to God, you know, so to God be the glory. Anyway, Amen. that's my final word. Miss Danette, what's your final word? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just thank you for having me. Um, all the things that I've learned, the bags and just being able to share my experience. Hopefully it'll help change some things, implement some things, make some things better. So thank you. Okay. So as I said, this is Wake the Nation. Thank you once again for tuning in and listening. Uh, thanks, Kirk, for tuning in. Um, I am Florencia Changajito, and I'm the host, co-host, Mrs. Thais Love, co-host, Mrs. Crystal Collier, production, yeah. Kamali Vernon, and our guest, Danette Green. And so tune in next time. To, uh, we, we do uh, Wake the Nation once per month. And so it will also be on YouTube channel under Flo Chang Ajita. And I will send you ladies the video. So be blessed and have a good night, everyone. And I do pray that someone tonight will have hope. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for sharing. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.